Hello everyone, today we talk about Eastern Balkan warfare between the mid 11th and the mid 14th century. You know that even though I made over 1500 videos, we're still at the very beginning of everything and presenting uh, introductively these topics that at some point we'll, we uh, address uh, ever more uh, in depth. So you know that aside from having created a Balkan history and, and also warfare, if I'm not wrong, but with this one I will create it anyway if it's not there. Um, playlist and made several videos about the region that I should also upload more frequently, more uh, in, in, in perspective. Um, I have already discussed, uh, in fact, uh, the, the s s some of the in fact protagonists we'll see here. We often talk about Bulgarian history, we talk about the Vlachs, I recently made a video about Moldova, um, something about Serbia as well. I made a video on Balkan heraldry in late medieval times. So we have began to, aside from you know general history, the, the Ottoman invasions and so on, we have began to approach a bit the area and we'll keep doing that. Uh, and today that's yet another little step toward that direction. So the Balkans we're discussing today um, were fragmented at the time as much as they still are, politically speaking. Uh, most of the region's inhabitants were Slavs, as you know, um, and they included Bulgarians, Macedonians, Serbs, Bosnians, Dalmatians, Croats, and Slovenes. Um, and the last four groups were largely Catholic, aside from the Bogomils that were essentially a Manichaean uh, group in Bosnia. Um, those were quite important, as you know, in history of religions. They, they triggered uh, everybody so much that even the Byzantines, to whom the concept of crusade was alien, waged, in fact, a holy war uh, against them. In the Balkans, they probably helped reactivating also, in fact, but what we call as Catharism, but it was the, the same Gnosticism. Uh, in the West, but this group uh, will be discussed in the Western Balkan warfare uh, video that I will make uh, at some point, because um, um, alongside with the uh, non-Slav Albanians, they fit another military culture that is worth um, analyzing uh, more more directly. I made a, a video about the Croats. Uh, we have discussed say Adriatic history. Um, at large, also the Union one, and we'll keep doing so. Um, so we remained with these three peoples, essentially, the Bulgarians, the Macedonians, and the Serbs, being Orthodox Christians. Uh, today we deal also with the largely nomadic blacks that also settle in Moldova, as we have seen at the expenses of the, the steppe peoples that largely inhabited the area. There are debates about that, but we will see perhaps today better in terms of military uh, influences and panoplies and so on, what what we're talking about. Whereas the Greeks of the Aegean and Ionian coasts will be dealt with in a Byzantine warfare dedicated video. Make lots of videos about Byzantine warfare already more in detail than this kind of general warfare series. About this kind of full medieval period, but I yet have to make, in fact, this specific one for, for the Byzantines um, as well. But in part, naturally, we'll, we have already seen it and we'll keep seeing it in this video because the main influence in the region was definitely Byzantine from a military point of view, albeit from a certain point onwards, mostly from, from, from an artistic, iconographic point of view, then archaeology tells us something different. So, starting from the beginning, of course, um, virtually the entire region early in the 11th century, except the Slovene territory and parts of Dalmatia, were under Constantinople, right? With a, you know, of course, in the furthermost areas, um, with a considerable degree of decentralization and so on, but the entire Balkans fell under the Byzantine 
domination in a way or another. If we look at the left bank of the Danube, um, so the lands of modern day Romania lay instead out of Byzantine control, as they were dominated loosely but either by Hungary or by nomadic peoples from the western steppes uh, that however in fact hardly had a firm control on the on the sedentary populations of especially of Transylvania. Some of them were also relatively semi nomadic, mostly for transhumans, etc. Um, and as you know, the definition of Balkans geographically here can include different things, right? It's obvious that from a cultural point of view, also what was on, for example, the left bank of the Danube, but south of the Carpathians was much more Byzantine influenced than Transylvania, that is mostly kind of a central European area, culturally speaking. And this corridor, in fact, that um, comes from, from the steppes uh, and enters the Danubian Valley and rises up, towards Central Europe was a very important channel of uh, military influence from Eastern Europe that, as we will see, leaves traces as far as Serbia in the, in the Balkan hinterland. Um, uh, we made recently a video about medi early medieval Transylvania. We will probably make uh, others naturally for the high and late medieval time. Uh, so the essentials are there. Also have a playlist on Hungarian history and warfare. So that's the other giant that, that dominates in between essentially the Holy Roman Empire and the Byzantine one in this uh, area, of mostly central, but uh, including part of the Balkans and also Eastern Europe. Um, and that has a significant um, also step character for, for a long time. Uh, that maybe influenced the the Balkans uh, in that sense also without counting the the major influence from from the steppes in the Nubian corridor um, and naturally the same Hungarians made extensive use of steppes troops for that matter Kuhlmanns um, we'll talk about that at some other point I made a video on the Byzantine auxiliary forces um, around the 10th the 11th century that can be um, interesting because it analyzes essentially the the, the Pachinax, Pazinax, uh warfare and that was pretty much um, a standard of the step that however literally reversed in en masse in this area were settled we talked also about the the Scandinavian settlement um, in the Balkans which is a, a very overlooked topic telling the truth because we think of the Varangian Guard as mostly just uh, the, the ultra-elite guys of the Guard with axes, but m most of them did, were actually an, a normal army like the others, and so most of them are actually, first of all, m many more in lighter troops and were settled here and there in the Balkans. And this broader frontier between Hungary and, and Constantinople, let's say, was uh, so with in between important entities such as the Bulgarian Empire at some point, um, was extremely... Uh, um, lose in many ways it was huge so in a sense you could understand what the layers the, 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 the boundaries were but speaking of cultural influences especially military wise was also a great blender um, and receiving lots of other external influences as we will see now from basically any direction by the time of the first crusade the Serbs had won a large measure of autonomy. This, the, the same Frederick Barbarossa crossing uh, the Balkans towards the East Nordest, managing to assert also an important influence on these mountaineers, warlike mountaineers that were essentially had managed to carve uh, a space from the, say, Constantinopolitan side as opposed to the neighboring Bosnians and and Croatians that had fallen, as we've seen in another, in another uh, area and, and kind of domination at the end of the day, um, and this autonomy uh, would continue o over time, especially with the collapse of of the same Byzantine Empire in 1204. 
Uh, towards the end of the 12th century, also the Bulgarians, after having been essentially uh, subjugated by Basil uh, II in, uh, in the 11th century, um, had reasserted their own independence. I made a video specifically on this, the rise of the Second Bulgarian Empire. So, with the Fourth Crusade, the capture of Constantinople, the whole imperial system collapses, right? So this is a major civilizational watershed because, albeit the Byzantine Empire was already somewhat uh, shattered and privatizing and ruled by oligarchs in a ever more kind of feudal direction in spite of the attempt of um, stemming this phenomenon. Uh, there was still a state, like differently from other uh, countries in Europe, that founded properly on the um, Romano-Greco um, uh, centralistic tradition. And the collapse of this giant brought naturally to, to a major destabilization of the region, which eventually the Ottomans would have profited and so on. Um, and pushing the Balkan peoples that had always been looming over the uh, more uh, urbanized and richer uh, coastal areas that were effectively the the, em the Byzantine Empire, well, whereas the interland was really something else that had already in the centuries naturally um, engaged in continuous raiding warfare, joining these waves from from the north and so on but uh, never managed to break through. At this point, instead, they have the chance to capitalize on the Byzantine destruction, exploiting also the weakness of the Latin Empire. As you know, the Palaiologo eventually managed to reconquer Const Constantinople, but the system is compromised because also the same Byzantines actually are multiple states, right? Uh, Greece was divided between minor crusader principalities. Um, that was the Byzantine despotate of Epirus, um, the revived uh, Byzantine Empire of Nicaea before Palaiologo eventually reconquered from Constantinople from, from here. So th there was a um, possibility of re-expansion from these states. As we've seen, the Serbs had maintained a relatively small state up to that point. Um, the Albanians also enjoyed a short-lived independence. And however, there were other powers that were mm, in fact to exploit the the essentially the Balkan weakness at that point because by the mid 14th century Hungary had extended its domination over all of what is today's Romania right and had been consolidating it the problems of controlling the the periphery were, were always there but uh, the Hungarian state is developing along Side the pattern of a Western feudal monarchy, and so by the, the 14th century is properly statalizing as well. Uh, much of Romania would soon be lost again, but still um, the imposance of Hungary remains in the region. Bulgaria had contracted, right? The, the mid 14th century, as we've seen, is a moment of broader uh, exhaustion of some sort. Um, and Bulgaria was also heavily blended with with other uh, with other powers like the the blacks in part also some steps um, forces that um, poured from again the Danubian corridor through the country to the kind of the richer Byzantine south. Serbia in this profited by conquering a, a large yet ephemeral empire stretching from the Danube to the Gulf of Corinth which had been possible just thanks because to this vacuum of power. Normally, Bulgaria had been the strongest um, of the Balkanian powers um, historically, then had kept shrinking and uh, eventually was brought, as we've seen, under uh, Byzantine Empire, so that also its reactivation was somewhat um, on the wake of the broader European revival of the, of the 13th century. 12th, 13th century, but um, eventually would, it didn't have the mm, the central basis that had had been laid by the uh, 
by the first empire with great effort before they were essentially destroyed by by Constantinople. Uh, Serbia had not had that, that force, um, if not uh, remaining an autonomous power, more distant from Constantinople. And so when all these players kind of contracted, the Western presence in Greece weakened and so on, it was objectively the, the, the only power that could capitalize on this. And this uh, warlike mountaineers who mentally had the, the, this kind of vigorous push managed to extend their control uh, that far uh, up to the Aegean. Uh, but the, the thing had no more bases than, in fact, the, the local ones. So it was to, uh, to contract again. And, you know, later on, the Ottomans essentially swarmed in the Balkans, first in Bulgaria, then in, um, in, in fact, against Serbia. And we will talk about those um, struggles because, as you know, are very defining in the local kind of uh, national mythology and this sense, especially of, of uh, dark martyrdom, like the Balkans, and especially in their uh, in their interland, are definitely uh, characterized by the, the book which you find actually pretty much all over the Slavic world. This sense of um, of darkness, actually, of, of martyrdom, of, of 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 sacrifice, of blood spilled, um, and the Balkans were definitely some of the most primitive areas in in Europe by by some standards, and they uh, they they maintained lots even of the kind of older even pagan ethos in a in a cultural even mythological religious sense we have seen it. The presence even of, I don't know, bird bulbs, of uh, the black crowds, right? So all these actual tonic symbols that were proper of kind of the, the, the secondary powers that needed to emerge, but that concentrated a great part of their um, military culture and this individualistic um, kind of uh, heroism to, to, to be molded in the most obscure and bloody um, rituals and uh, initiations and, and so on and and we'll, that, that's why this is so interesting to to analyze because the rest of Europe was really literally spinning up towards probably a, a startled even permanent military uh, organization with just something else and as we will see in fact the Balkans will be dramatically influenced by um, Western arms armor technology and and we have seen it even for Hungary back in the day, um, but um, we will talk about it again. The uh, Crusader principalities in the area held a small part of southern Greece, right? Venice and Genoa struggled for control over most of the Greek islands, as you know, but that's probably a maritime scenario, and it was just dominated by the Italians. Nobody else had um, until the rise of the Ottoman Empire, properly the capacity of countering these uh, naval forces, uh, and uh, that were, by the way, completely uninterested in any form of land possession, aside from the the main islands of the Aegean. So, but they also were very interested, however, in playing in Balkan policy and uh, politics. We, we've seen it very often, also with um, Moldova, the point. Um, uh, there was an important Genoese backing and, and and more, so that channel doesn't have to be underestimated either in a broader civilizational perspective. Um, and at this point, the Byzantine Empire, as you know, had also shrunk to a few isolated provinces that fundamentally corresponded also to the major centers like Constantinople, Thessaloniki, and so on, and they were just trying to coordinate. Uh, Still, this ideally universal rule, but with much less resources than than before. Of course, the the older empire had had finished in 1204. Now, culturally and even politically, Constantinople had, of course, been the main influence throughout most of the Balkan Peninsula. Historically, uh, you see that even Hungary, that fundamentally becomes a, a Western Catholic country, 
um, more under kind of Germanic influence, uh, still maintains in material culture, uh, essentially a more like a Byzantine flavor until especially the 13th to 14th century. And uh, during the period under consideration, however, Western and Central European influence became ever more impactful, especially in fact, properly from a military point of view. And this was naturally felt as far as the broader Balkans are concerned, mostly in Croatia, in Bosnia, that were uh, in fact importantly close to to Hungary, to Germany, to Italy. But this affected Serbia too, because Serbia, uh, uh, as you know, was also invaded multiple times by the, the Hungarians. Um, so uh, the, 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 the broader hybrid deriving always from warfare shows um, incredible consequences also uh, in this area, as we'll see now. Except for Serbia, the most important Western influence, especially in terms of military technology, came, yes, through uh, Hungary, but uh, especially from the Mediterranean, through the um, the Republic of Ragusa, the Brovnik, which served um, as a major channel for the importation of Italian arms and armor, which was sold all over Bosnia, Serbia, Bulgaria, uh, southern Hungary, greater Moldavia, and even Byzantine Greece. Naturally, Italians influenced also from probably the Byzantine area because, as you know, at, at that point the Palaiologoi had reconquered most of their territories through the help of the Genoese, the Venetians were always there, the Italians were also in, in the Black Sea, so the entire uh, uh, Balkan peninsula was in a sense, uh, unavoidably, um, in interacting with the outer world through the Italian medium. And as we'll see now, this has a remarkable impact. And we can, in fact, already start analyzing these specific um, uh, evidence. Um, there are some carved reliefs in the Church of the Virgin at Studenica in Serbia, in late, uh, dating to the late 12th century. And displaying an evidently Western European influence, both in style and in the broader content of the of the art and so on. And the closest parallels, uh, artistically speaking, are to be found uh, in the Siculo Norman Kingdom, right? So that at that time was a major power, as you know, in the central Mediterranean, and um, had also important ambitions in the in the Balkans as it invaded Epirus multiple times, it threatened Constantinople, sacked to Salonika, and so on. So um, the idea that the Serbian military equipment, as early as, well, the late 12th century, is, um, is strongly influenced by uh, southern Italy is, um, is pretty, pretty clear um, and realistic. Um, it, it's naturally important to stress that we have in terms probably of sources, archaeologically and documentarily, much less evidence for the Balkans than, say, the aforementioned Italy and or, and or Western Europe uh, more broadly, right? And that uh, what we get, of course, the most is what the elite could pay for. So the elite, as always, is the most international force, is the one that picks the best and knows how to use it, exactly because it, it's, the, uh, it's the establishment that has the force of being so. So naturally, we have less uh, and different evidence from the kind of what the, in this case, like the average Serbian could have looked like on the battlefield. But this Western influence is, is striking and it basically gets down all to Italian influence, right? Even the the, the central European one through Hungary is is scarce, considering that Hungary too was importantly influenced by uh, by Western warfare, because we have seen that um, uh, through the construction of the Arpad uh, Kingdom, uh, the the settlement of properly Western mercenaries coming from literally from everywhere um, in the West. There are Germans, uh, Italians, English, French, Spanish, like literally this, and knights specifically. Right, so literal uh, vassals settled 
in Hungary to also reinforce royal power against the ethnic oligarchy that uh, naturally opposed tendentially the, the centralization process of like partaking it uh, as long as it could be co-opted as well. Um, we have an interest set of weapons from the Rash uh, Castle in Serbia dating to the early 13th century. Uh, there are interesting examples of uh, tanked and socketed um, uh, armor-piercing arrowheads, which are very fascinating. Uh, there is also an early 13th century broad arrowhead, which may have been used for hunting or was maybe more specifically designed for unarmored foes. But then we have a larger blade, which mm, perhaps belonged to a, a javelin. It was a javelin head. And it, it displays um, typical Mediterranean or coastal, as they're um, very often in this kind of um, Balkan iconography called, technically it means from the coast, from, from Dalmatia, right, from Kotor mostly, um, as the main most important center. Um, rather than, in fact, inland Serbian, right? And uh, this is dated to the 30s, the 40s of the 13th century. Then we have beautiful wall paintings, mostly that, as you see also from the pictures, are the main iconographic source from the Sopozani Monastery. This is Serbian dating to the 1260s. Uh, and it um, shows naturally an important degree of stylized and archived um, art, uh, as the Byzantine models, as you know, are very uh, crystallized, repetitive, uh, iconically, in fact. And this is a bit of a, of a problem in the broader Orthodox area because the art kind of never changes, but the arms and armor did. Right, it's like I don't know in Russia they kept you depicting uh, heroes just like in the same Roman Hellenic uh, classical style that was used uh, by the Byzantines. But we know that in the same period the the Russians had basically looked indistinguishable from from the Mongols. They were 13th century, so uh, there is an interesting comparison here and however also in iconography we can spot some interesting details that speak volumes about what you know some properly um, ver very accurately depicted by the way military gear could could be truly like um, and the Sopozani uh, wall paintings compared to the nearby ones of Milasevo, it was just uh, one generation older, show an important degree of military evolution from the previous um, kind of Byzantine uh, style. Um, Flat-topped shields and tall-pointed chapelle de fer helmets, for example, or with prominent brims, uh, appear uh, these are, of course, present also in, for in early 14th century Byzantine art, but in fact, this is somehow a half century um, before, uh, which suggests that some Western influence, or at least some, you know, less cultural resistance to actually uh, depict in art something more, more heterogeneous, uh, manifested in Serbia. Consider that in in the same period the um, the Kingdom of Bulgaria was the second most powerful Balkan state after the revived uh, Byzantine Empire. So Serbia had not risen again like it would during the early 14th century. So um, one could say that Bulgaria and Constantinople may have shared some kind of greater homogeneity um, uh, with one another and also some common influence from the Rus at this point, a, a more prominent one than, than Serbia that instead appears to have been under stronger Hungarian and Italo-Dalmatian influence. There are other Serbian wall paintings from the Church of Arilje dating to 1296. Um, 
they depict warrior saints, uh, martyrdom scene, and, and so on. And um, what is clear, generally speaking, is the similarity with Italian art, not only in arms and armor, and also in costume for that matter, but interestingly in horse hardness and saddles. And it's important to stress that Hungary had a hell of an equestrian culture. So the fact that the Serbians that were from the other side of the Adriatic, the Dinaric Alps and so on, would represent in their own art something that looks definitely more Western European, which was also very advanced, equestrianly speaking, um, as, as opposed to kind of an Hungarian Central European influence is, is quite meaningful regarding the um, properly the, the advancement and the reach of um, areas like Italy and uh, in a sense also beyond um, in, in, the ba in the very heart of the Balkans, right? Also the Svords in the Arelia wall paintings are purely European, right? We'll see now that there is an we were hinting at before are important also steps and even Middle Eastern military influence in the Balkans especially after the Ottoman invasion um, and uh, yet here Serbia 1296 everything looks um, Western uh, except uh, it, this should be about the way the swords are carried right which, which is not so Western and in that regard could actually show that bit more of step uh, bias that surely some Serbian knights had in similarly to, I don't know, the Bulgarian, the Hungarian ones, um, and also more of faraway ones. Uh, there are some re relief carvings from the Datsani Monastery in Kosovo, uh, dating to 1327 and 1335. There are several figures um, interesting to, to to note but let's say the, the broader carvings are mostly in the in the Kotor coastal style um, they have much in common also with the Albanian art at this point um, uh, because uh, the, the the area was as you know under uh, the Serbian Empire temporarily uh, but this was also very strongly Italian influenced, right? Not just from the Venetian ruled Dubrovnik, Ragusa, but also from the Kingdom of Naples on the other side of the Adriatic. In fact, the Angevins at this point were trying, uh, if you remember the general history, that is to invade the Balkans. Again, they had principalities in Albania, in Greece, and thus the, the, there's no. Uh, surprise of seeing further you know Italian military influence in a Serbian uh, dominated area um, this by the way was the moment when uh, Stefan Dushan established properly the, em the empire uh, stretching from Belgrade to the Gulf of Patras so um, there was surely further influence uh, uh, foreign influence from those channels as well um, if you look at the Detani uh, carvings, you can see Western style weaponry, right? Albeit it's somewhat plain standard by early 14th century uh, time. And uh, there are some interesting archaisms as well. For example, conical helmets that may have even been still of Spangenhelm construction. And um, yes, that that's how archaic in many ways uh, the Balkan heartland could could be, and we will see also another example of the same helmet uh, construction type. Uh, we see normally bows, spears, swords, small bucklers. Mm -hmm. uh, body armor would have also looked somewhat uh, backwards for most Westerners at that time, con considering that it consists of a simple male shirt, hauberk, and male shoes, um, with what appears to be a lamellar cuirass, uh, albeit the latter may be, um, you know, the kind of iconographic uh, style, kind of Byzantine influence art, rather than uh, 
representing a real armor, at least in that specific fashion of lamellar uh, construction. I made a video about lamellar armor, by the way, so if you're interested, you can check that out as well. Uh, in, the s in the same Datsani monastery dating to 1338 and the, the mid-century, um, there, are, there, there are also other paintings, um, again, still influenced by the coastal school that we have defined. Um, and there is an interesting uh, visored bassinet worn by a saint. Now, one may think, well, this is type of, of helmet that was, was popular in Italy at the time, so you may trace that Western influence as well uh, in, in, in the Balkans. However, uh, it seems evident that who painted this uh, bassinet didn't um, know how to, to, to do it very well, right? So uh, this may uh, entail a kind of imitation of a model that definitely was an Italian military or artistic influence in the region, but that was not so widespread to, you know, spread uh, to to make the land acquire such a, a deep awareness, even in the, in the artistry of how it was actually looking. Um, the, um, for example, the piece raised above the saint's brow represents a true visor uh, or some kind of hinged throat covering bevel. Um, you don't understand quite well. Um, there is a male flap hanging behind one helmet in, in the paintings, um, which could be a doubled overlap from uh, the male aventail that appears beneath. There are comparable but shorter male flaps seen in 14th century Italy. And on this occasion, it could be that it was actually the Balkans and the broader East that was influencing the West in turn, right? And we will see it later as well, because there are some, uh, for example, uh, Italian paintings, Italian art depicting some t type of armor that they associated with, let's say, the Saracens, the infidels, the Easterners, in a, in a, in a broader sense, and that does appear in places like the Balkans more prominently. So in that case, again, there may have been in fact a broad awareness of what kind of armor w was there, given the, the fact that the area was so frequented by the Venetians, the Genoese, and so on. And so mm, this may have brought even the same Western mercenaries to be equipped locally with that kind of arms and armor that they purchased. Um, as we've seen in other videos, this, this merchants and mercenaries arrived as far as uh, Crimea, as far as Persia, right? So uh, it's, it's really that broad. But naturally, we mostly reason statistically when we have to assess, like, what kind of, you know, influence is there. Like, art is not infinite. Like, all this evidence is somewhat precious on its own and unique. So we have to understand also how it came about. And this specific evidence could be important to interpret some broader Byzantine and Balkan art where you see this unclear flaps or kind of apparent helmet, uh, helmet extensions. And you may think it's that kind of doubled aventail that is more um, thoroughly represented here. Uh, as we will see further degrees still next to a Western European influence, also a Turco-Mongol one, because especially by the 13th, the 14th century, you know that the entire Pontic area, the, the Eastern Mediterranean and the Balkans were importantly influenced by the Ottomans, the, probably the Mongolization of Islamic warfare in a sense, and also part of the same um, European one, as we've seen especially in Eastern Europe, um, so this stuff would start being noticed also in countries like the Eastern Balkan ones. Um, there is an arrow of apparent double-headed form that um, is uh, seen inside a box-like quiver with a door-like flap or cover, which may suggest even this kind of 
Um, speaking of Western style sword, for example, we find one in the current parish church wall painting uh, from Serbia, 1335. Uh, albeit here you see a winged mace that um, is a bit um, more kind of Eastern uh, in nature, not necessarily altogether, but I mean the fact that uh, maces were a bit more widespread in the East a bit uh, more than, than in the West historically. And yet there is what seems like a clumsy depiction of a kite-shaped shield, which is somewhat also uh, in a broader hybrid. Um, there is a St. Demetrius depicted in the wall painting of the Pak Patriarchate in Kosovo. This is a Serbian source of the mid-14th century. And here you see the saint carrying a typical 14th century sword with a small round shield slung over his shoulder. He wears a light male shirt under a tunic. And this type of kind of lighter equipment uh, is pretty similar to the infantry one in early 14th century Italy and especially in the Dalmatian possessions of Venice. Um, so kind of more agile troops uh, a bit for properly the naval um, uh, the, the more dynamic amphibious operations in a way but also this broader Eastern influence in the area. In any case, we're talking just not about the the heavies that were, however, present there as well. So as you understand, generally speaking, in the area, Serbian art dominates because this was the power who had somehow greater compaction in the period analyzed. This, there are these interesting uh, monastic foundations with uh, paintings commissioned by the the Serbian nobility and so on, and as we've seen, Serbia was also, uh, you know, the, the, is also the westernmost uh, area here. So, um, but we have evidence of Western influence naturally also further east. For example, there are the um, wall paintings of the Bojana Church in Sofia. Uh, so, twelve fifty nine, Bulgaria. Uh, there are several pictures um, and only a few military figures. And uh, these show an important degree of Western European uh, gear, right? Despite the fact that the entire complex artistically is in Byzantine style. For example, there is a flat top shield that is identical to those seen in the West. Um, and in fact, the Byzantines at this point had the triangularly elongated ones. Um, I think we documented recently in that video about 13th century. No, it was actually a 14th century uh, Byzantine cavalry man, but there were these kind of archaisms still. Um, also, the sword is purely European. There is a soldier in short sleeved male hauberk with some kind of um, unusual splinted neck and shoulder protection, uh, which may have been uh, attached to the aventail of his helmet, or it may even be like uh, a part of a separate coif to be formed. Um, there is also, and famously enough, and we see it, we saw it, in fact, also in the video about Balkan heraldry, a, a typical Central Mediterranean ship type, and um, also uh, bearing uh, some shields uh, similar to the ones of the Western tradition at this point, as you know, had become shorter and smaller bearing these uh, heraldic devices. There are some weapons from 14th century Bulgaria, including a broken sword blade, uh, a restored sword blade, broad harrow heads, a van brace for the lower arm in the original uh, status, some restored van braces, spear heads um, in 
profanity, a knife, um, three-sided arrow head, uh, other arrow heads, sword pommels, um, actually only one sword pommel, and a large lance blade. And this is a very varied set, uh, and it is believed to derive from different culture uh, mixing in the Bulgarian capital of Tarnovo. Um, and the date, so the mid, mid to late 14th century, would speak probably of the period of the, of the Ottoman domination already. Um, some, especially the smaller items, were mm, produced locally. Um, and there are, however, some interesting Western imports that are to be identified in the sword and uh, surely in the Vambrace as well. So this of course means that the same Ottomans in great part were heavily westernized, especially by, by uh, in fact Eastern standards if we can talk about them in these terms. Now whereas the military elites on the western side of the Balkans uh, were essentially sucked into the, the broader west, the ones of the eastern Balkans were affected by this process in, in a lower form. So as we have already understood from these examples that display a greater Western influence, the bulk of the Eastern Balkans art, iconography, etc., and also archaeological finds, etc., is Byzantine. Uh, and this is true naturally f for the 11th to 12th century, so in moments probably of, of great re expansion of the Byzantine Empire and of very high military standards, also military technology that was at the same level of the Western one. Um, and in moments in which the Empire literally reconquered most of these areas, right, and could spread, in fact, more directly such, uh, such military influence. However, as we were saying before, this was also rendered possible uh, thanks to the um, traditional Byzantine reliance on an impressive set of uh, foreign auxiliary forces that at some point were also Balkan. In fact, I made a video about Byzantine auxiliaries also that in, in, in actually in early medieval times that includes Bulgars, Serbs, etc. So if you're interested, you can check that out as well. Fr from this time, we were mentioning before the nomadic Turks of the Western steppes that literally abundant uh, were uh, they used to raid the entire kind of uh, coast of, of, of the Black Sea and even pushing f uh, further into the, the Balkan uh, interland. So the Balkans were very affected by this in a general sense. Uh, we'll see in other videos that there were some, for example, shield forms or also an important amount of archery that w were probably designed in this broader crescent that goes from from the Balkans to Eastern Europe probably to to cope with the light uh, archers mounted archers of, of the steppes and therefore there was let's say a, a more civilized influence from a state like Constantinople and a much wilder one from from the steppes that blended in each of these contexts, by the way. For example, the basic military styles of the Bulgarian and the Second Bulgarian Empire from the late 12th to the 14th century uh, were evidently Byzantine in nature, right? Uh, the Bulgarian warriors had been serving in the Byzantine armies for centuries, and even though we can see that there is an important degree of uh, privatization, of feudalization, and also of Western influence, in fact, in that kind of also broader military organization. The, um, the main model, of course, of military um, 
military uh, imitation was the Byzantine imperial one. There is an interesting Eastern European influence as well through the Danubian route. Um, for example, and this is especially true for Constantinople and Bulgaria, but there are traces of that also in, in Serbia. Um, we find similarities with medieval Russian arms that were in turn also influenced by steppes, nomads, or as the Hungarians were, for example. However, when we look at Balkan warfare, on average, we realize that horse archery played only a minor role. It was there. Um, horse archery actually existed everywhere in the continent. Like, even Western Europeans had it throughout all the, the period, even though it's not so um, publicized, let's say. Um, and uh, it's obvious that the Balkans had more horse archery than, than the, the West let's say. Um, and of course there were more steps mercenaries properly hired in bands from the steps also among the Balkan princes. Uh, this is especially true for Bulgaria. right? That's quite evident and again that's what the Byzantines did at, at large. Um, the, the Serbians were kind of a bit more mountaineers, but more kind of resistant and uh, infantry paid, so mostly having to stem these kind of people's attacks. Remember that the Hungarians had large bodies of Kumans, also because their their ruling dynasty at some point married into even some Kuman nobility and so on. Um, in very late times, like in the 13th century, the 14th century, especially after the Mongols had pushed all these people's towards the west and so the local rulers had somewhat exploited the thing to counter the, the ethnic nobility politically. Uh, Macedonia is similar as you understand it's somehow like like a blend between Bulgaria and, 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 and Serbia. Considered that the, this little country had uh, um, an important independent phase in the early 11th century, right? Whereas eventually underwent Byzantine, Bulgarian, and finally Serbian domination in uh, in sequence. And as we were speaking before, this kind of light troops that are somehow metal armored by a certain degree, we have a mail shirt from Mikhailovo, so 12, 13. 15th century Bulgaria, which is um, present at the um, local historical museum of Mazanlik. Uh, the inventory should be number 643. And it's in the original condition of construction. And it shows a double neck opening. And it can be regarded, in a sense, as the standard relatively like to keep Balkan warrior armor both in Bulgaria and in the neighboring states including the Byzantine Empire in a moment of greater professionalization of Balkan armies because of more wealth around so not dif much differently from from the West but in fact with not with the same degree of heaviness that in the West would have brought to mostly a plus being the protagonist the, a heavy uh, cavalrymen so with, with a heavier equipment than this but still with in fact enough uh, protection as you can see here to allow um, roles that are not merely the one of a horse archer right or a skirmisher of some sort but in fact uh, also some assault uh, infantry this could be easily dismounted uh, cavalrymen at the same time and, and the Balkans were that kind of uh, flexibly designed militarily speaking to uh, let's say connect both kind of a step riding um, strategy and tactics with a more instead kind of heavier frontal charge uh, fortification storming and so on in a much heavier way so um, this this is an interesting find. 
So as we were saying before, the, the Serbs um, emerged in the 11th century as two distinct principalities, evolving um, eventually towards a unified state, albeit with important divisions of various houses uh, that change importantly. These this were not uh, really centralized powers, right? They were somehow in between. Um, they were not fully feudal because they didn't have enough surplus as much as the Westerners and had had to create feudal states on their own. So th this were still kind of the evolution of a tribal clanic reality that was progressively kind of westernizing and um, heading towards a process of statalization that however was more um, more unstable than than in the West and that's the reason why at the end of the day Serbia even with this important mm, kind of moral push and military potential kind of exhausted itself against the Ottomans that uh, on the long run took it over right um, and um, they even managed to defeat the Byzantines in 1172 so they, they were a force to be reckoned with and uh, that's the reason why Serbia rose to regional dominance after having defeated the same Bulgarians in 1330 because that was the only power could objectively contend from within the same Balkans uh, the broader um, domination on the region as we've seen, Serbia was the most westernized of the Eastern Balkan countries. Um, we've seen spears, maces, straight uh, swords for horsemen, um, spears, uh, uh, staff weapons, bows, and later crossbows for the infantry. Right? Uh, as we'll see now, Serbians were somehow renowned even for, for their archery. Uh, which may be due also to the the same nature of, of the Balkan interland. You know that uh, it's pretty mountainous, so much that Balkan in, in Turkish literally m means mountains. Um, it's brutal, right? It's 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 cold. It's um, in in uh, in the bad season. It's uh, it's heavily forested. Um, so guerrilla ambushes, um, shots from from the above, let's say, would uh, definitely develop uh, kind of uh, a missile a consistent relevant missile element within these countries let's not call it doctrine but simply fighting style the Serbian army consisted of essentially feudal forces like it would be normal under local lords strengthened especially in the later period by mercenary units made up both of locals and foreigners. The latter being mostly Germans, albeit um, there were also Catalans or other Spaniards playing a significant role, especially in the mid 14th century. Um, this is interesting for a number of reasons. First of all, the okay, the German mercenaries at that time, like the 13th, the 14th century, were kind of normal. Um, it would be interesting to see how much they, fr fr since when they interfered as far as. Uh, say as um, Serbia in the broader central European area especially through Hungary as we've seen while the Catalans probably poured from the south and or from Naples because that's where essentially they began to operate uh, after the Vespers uh, with the Cap Grand Cap Catalan company made a video about that in the, in the at least its military organization in the east in Greece um, while in certain parts of Western Europe uh, actually this normally lighter type of infantry which is typical of the Amogal virus and so on was was actually disappearing right for example if you see Italy that we mentioned so often and also for the influence it had on Serbian arms and armor well uh, at a certain point they, they they kick out all the cattons they say we, we want only German and French mercenaries um, and heavy cavalry uh, prevails so uh, I don't think we can draw that connection, which studied I think much more thoroughly. But the fact that the the Serbians could use Catalan forces, etc., is perhaps more connected with the uh, the Dusan Empire in that arrived up to the Aegean rather than some kind of uh, Serbian hinterland logic of some sort. For which, however, instead s the German mercenaries and or other kind of, uh, in fact, more common type of mercenaries would have been more, more normal 
Um, the Serbian army was theoretically divided into units of 15, 50, 100, 1,000 men. Um, and at this point, it's so the, the one of the empire, the short-lived empire, um, the main strength of, of the Serbians lay in cavalry and infantry archers. Uh, naturally, peasant levies were, were summoned, and somebody said, oh, look, you know, the, the Serbians have a greater missile bias because from when we start documenting them satisfactorily, from an organic point of view, we see that um, there were uh, heavy cav cavalrymen and, and, um, and archers of some sort, or crossbowmen. Well, the point is that by the mid 14th century, like, especially in Western Europe, that was the, the type of, of army that existed, right? The great, mm, mm, say, peasant communal levies had been strong by the, the 12th, the 13th century, also the early 14th. Um, but the the tendency, uh, leaving aside the fact that yes, maybe uh, a country like Serbia would have actually had to produce some, like given that it was less socially stratified, more communal, con say or at least mountaineer contingents of some sort, and they probably did too, and this is uh, overlooked, especially for the defense of the homeland. Um, the broader tendency, especially also with this in Eastern influence, as we've seen, of you know more cavalry, more archery, uh, it fits make makes Serbia perhaps fit with with the norm of what you would expect, even considering its forces as still some kind of Western-like bulk, right? Um, and again, I think it's mostly the Balkan interland that would develop, if anything, some kind of uh, archery force, uh, which is true again for anyone who had to counter nomadic uh, invasions. I mean, Serbia was invaded by the Mongols, was invaded by other um, random raiders throughout all this history that rose up till the Danube. So the idea that, that Serbia, if, if you look at it, it, it as itself, it, it formed uh, within, again, from, from the Danubian uh, uh, watershed side of, of the Balkan mountains, but still pretty much kind of uh, sheltered by, by the mountains and um, thus in, in a condition of, of, um, of inferiority that brought them to mostly defend the various, the various attackers, whether they were Hungarians most of the times and this other steps peoples um, or the Byzantines themselves at a point. And then by the, by the early 14th century, given that um, especially in, in the south, other powers had started giving way. They have this, okay, it's our time, right? And they, they expand. But there doesn't seem to have been a, you know, more sophisticated kind of military uh, organization that somehow made this country peculiar on its own, right? Uh, generally speaking, sedentary Europeans vote more or less in the same ways. Um, the 14th century saw, uh, as we've seen, important developments in Serbian military equipment that are to be attributed directly or indirectly to an Ottoman Turkish or more broadly Turkic uh, nomad influence. Right? Consider that the Ottomans had yet to invade the Balkans when we spot this, uh, the aforementioned. Uh, Turco-Mongolian influence, and some of this may have come through Hungary um, in some way, given that it was under the influence of Eurasian steppe peoples by by some degree. Um, we don't have to underestimate, of course, the human mobility. I mean, how many mercenaries could be present here and there? Or how many, maybe, how many Serbians? That we don't know. Um, served abroad and thus were influenced by more faraway places. This is also an interesting hypothesis. Um, in any case, such developments included mostly the adoption of curved sabers, composite bows, so they definitely 
mirror what was the general impact that especially Mongol warfare had had on Eastern Europe broadly meant and so it would fit a more general pattern um, and if we go back looking at Serbian influence uh, in a more native uh, natively biased sense and so what characters could have been more local or so Eastern as opposed to the Western influence that is also remarkable well we can uh, go look again at the weapons from the Rash castle as we've seen dating to the uh, 12th 13th century in this case there are mm, tank type arrowheads daggers knives um, and um, there are some mixed influences here the mace head uh, preserved here is typically Hungarian or Eastern European in style uh, Hungarians again had maintained a very not just an important kind of native style reminiscent of the steps but important connections as far as the Middle East right since the time of the migration and even afterwards with the Silk Road trade um, passing through the Danube and so on so this could affect Serbia in the process as well uh, the socket type arrow heads are on the other hand typically European which would make uh, the Serbians fit in the more Frankish influenced um, sedentary Slavic um, outskirts of the Hungarian Empire rather than kingdom right if you look all around the uh, also the Sudet and so on all these mountainous forested areas populated by Slavs even when they were nominally under Hungary they maintained typically sedentary kind of European and often properly Frankish influenced uh, weapon and as we've seen uh, the Frankish influence in Serbia also is essentially the one you see with uh, from from the Siculo Normans from Italy in general um, the the tank type of arrow however in the same pool of weapons is more step Asiatic do you know how many Asiatic uh, step horsemen were butchered down right crossing Serbia hoping to, to mm, loot and pillage some of the stuff well that that's how it may have happened the curved dagger or, or knives are also very interesting these are th there is all a beautiful blade uh, say per particular blade tradition in the Balkans of the various set of knives of again this blend of more Eastern coppice like influence things also very ancient ones right having to do with this brutal contact with, with the step since a uh, primordial time and uh, to the point of becoming also characteristic of the local style and continued to be used think about the Serbian high dogs and and their guerrilla later on when it was financed against the Ottomans by the Habsburgs by the, by the Venetians uh, these men were just like uh, see many other groups um, in the broader region that just that had that guerrilla as their their lifestyle right and for 12 13th century Serbia have to imagine at that important degree of primitiveness also in local warfare um, there are some beautiful wall paintings depicting the guards at the tomb um, in the monastery church of Milosevo Serbia dating to 1230 37 this is some of the best uh, documented iconography uh, of the time and the guards are represented essentially with um, an archaic Byzantine splinted arm defense and skirts they have large round shields helmets with aventails or separate mail coif with the ambiguity that we already described before these helmets are of two-piece construction that may date as early as the late Roman uh, styles and were certainly very common in the Eastern Mediterranean throughout all the early medieval period so remember these were more primitive 
interland peoples that somewhat dwelt at the outskirts of Byzantine civilization. So in a sense, those archaisms would be um, common. However, we find also as a broader Western influence in Serbian warfare again, a one piece helmet with its pointed crown tilted slightly forward the Phrygian way and this is definitely 12th century uh, Western influence or at, at least something that you don't find in uh, for the rest such standardly uh, Byzantine uh, archaically iconographic evidence like this one right there are some other wall paintings dating to 1300, around um, the aforementioned uh, Church of the Apostles in the Pag Patriarchate in Kosovo. Um, and there are some problems in the interpretation of this uh, evidence because it's very Byzantinely archaically pushed, almost exaggerated, especially for the times that were definitely already beyond. Uh, the the full hegemony of of Byzantine uh, civilization on, on this area. Yet, from some details, we can notice innovation. For example, there is a brimmed Chapelle de Fer warhead um, type. Uh, some of these examples are decorated with feathers that would be remain distinctive of Serbian and Bosnian warfare well into Ottoman times. Right? There are separate male collars or tippet appearing. Some are stiffened or padded as to stand proud of the neck. The shield is huge um, and quite uh, weirdly so. It's flat top and kite shaped. We see also a male coif and close uh, fitting round helmet which may be an identical copy of a western type there is a winged mace very uh, similar to the Turkish ones and it's wielded by um, a demon of some sort uh, so it may represent the topos of, let's say, this guy is an infidel or a force of evil and therefore is associated with the Turks. There are two simple helmets with, uh, with a, uh, a two-piece construction and a probable brim. There is um, a turban figure, however, uh, wielding uh, what seems to be a typically European sword. Um, wearing, by the way, also a male tippet that only covers his shoulders. And normally this was worn with other armor uh, of sort, uh, doesn't matter how composed. So um, we notice that such tippets are shown uh, in early 14th century Italian wall paintings. So we can spot a Western connection there too, but in this kind of local uh, blend, as we've seen. There is a dagger shown in the scene of the betrayal, which is quite interesting because it could represent this kind of more subtle guerrilla type of, of, of weaponry. Um, and in fact, it's very different also from the Italian type of daggers and the ones in, in other Western sources. Um, some say it could be Islamic influenced in this um, in the source which is an interesting theory as well from the accusation of Peter in the wall paintings of the Joachim and Anne church at, at the Studenitsa monastery uh, so this is dating to 1315 1320 we find a um, Roman soldier wearing uh, a type of tall, wide-brimmed helmet. The only two uh, 
uh, equivalents survive in Russia, interestingly enough. And the fact that its color is painted blue, just as the helmet in the source, uh, suggests that this was some kind of metallic uh, neck protection, was either male or splinted armor, and um, it's frequent in Serbian and other Balkan um, sources, and I don't know how I could explain that, perhaps more horse archery in this kind of greater um, Eastern influence for which we've seen the often the very interesting compositions for protecting the neck, um, but it could derive just from some other like more hand-to-hand -hand fighting uh, reasons, but I do suspect it has to do with with archery. Uh, there are other wall paintings uh, from the monastery church of Lesnovo in Macedonia dating to 1349, where we find um, one of the uh, earliest and, and also more clearly and realistically depicted curved Middle Eastern form of saber in Serbian art. Um, and it's interesting that uh, this find being Macedonian is also close to the Bulgarian frontier where the um, Ottoman influence uh, was greater. And it's different from the more slender and regularly tapering 13th and 14th century Eurasian steppe saber. Mm. Um, it's heavier. I it it um, had an angled back and very little taper throughout most of the length. And this, interestingly, connected with certain weapons, characteristics of 14th century Mamluk Egypt and Syria, uh, which surely had influenced the, the early Ottoman state that fundamentally emerged within the, the influence of, of the Mamluks. Um, so that's the medium to which he could have arrived in Balkan, Balkan art. Um, the, the less novel area fell within the Serbian Empire but was culturally closer to Constantinople and Bulgaria. In the same source we find a helmet with a raised visor which is uh, very similar even though it's somewhat poorly depicted to contemporary Western European helmets as well. There is um, a wall painting from the Church of Our Lady in Leviska in Prishren in Kosovo. Here we see a rider uh, carrying what is a very realistic, dr uh, realistically drawn, large flat topped shield of late Byzantine form that surely was influencing the area as well. We mentioned St. Mercurius wall painting at the Monastery of Grazanitsa in Kosovo, dating to 1320. This figure, uh, albeit uh, stylized, presents very realistic weaponry. Right, This sword is typically 14th century European. His shield is of the same large Byzantine form that we've seen earlier. The bow, albeit uh, unlikely large, is um, composite, evidently with bone tips or ears. The bow case is uh, styled in, in a typical Islamic fashion, which would point at a, an, Ottoman, an early Ottoman connection and even the, the quiver seems more like, um, even steps influenced than, than Middle Eastern. Uh, the helmet may be um, imitating an early Italian salad form. So again, you see an important blend from, from Byzantine, Middle Eastern steps, Western and also local elements. We have wall paintings from the chapel of St. Nicholas in, Sopo, in the Soposani Monastery, Serbian, dating to the 
say the 30s of, of the 14th century, which is um, further north, most of the evidence we have seen now. And you can notice that in this Serbian area, Byzantine influence is less marked. Um, there are figures with some form of splinted neck or shoulder protection. One carries probably a composite bow with a horn and bone ears plus a quiver. And this has specifically a um, laced lid flap carrying its arrows points uppermost, which is typical of steps archery. Um, and the saber um, is of the sharply curved, regularly tapering Turco Mongol type. Um, and it's a tricky evidence because it seems as if the hilt was angled in the wrong direction. But still, it speaks of um, this case. In fact, you see of an influence that is more steps, more Mongol, even in the north of Serbia, as opposed to the Ottoman one that maybe was even more kind of centrally influenced by uh, Mamluk Egypt. And this is very fascinating. We have uh, another wall painting, uh, the Road to Cavalry, uh, in the Church of the Holy Savior in Prizren, Kosovo, dating to the second fort of the 14th century. You see how many sources were concentrated at that point of the heyday of the Serbian Empire, and also just because it was just a, the great moment before the crisis. So. We we definitely have much more compared to, say, the 11th, the 12th century. Where here uh, we see less Byzantine archaisms. Uh, these soldiers represented uh, wear pointed helmets, which have almost bassinet form. That probably was more realistic than, in fact, what the the, the Byzantine canon would allow, and this would suggest, in fact, uh, even a greater Western influence than, than visible through this, through this art. The soldiers have male shirt as the only, at least, visible type of armor. The weapons include straight swords, a broad axe, spears, uh, also a huge um, non-symmetrical mace, um, and this weapon uh, was specifically famous in Iran and among the Seljuk Turks. Uh, it was known as Gurs specifically. Um, and this means again probably some Ottoman influence in, in Serbia at this point already. In the narthex of the Radoslav church at the monastery of Studenica, uh, here we, this, these are reliefs dating to the mid 14th, the early 15th century, so a, a bit older. But we have, in fact, problems exactly to date them correctly. In any case, there is a lot of Western influence um, displayed here, uh, with the most uh, visible uh, figure uh, wearing a rigid neck piece or plate bevor. And such type of armor is associated with, generally speaking, with the Easterners and the Romans in the 14th century Italian art which, in this sense, uh, makes the Bevor type uh, an Eastern Mediterranean Balkan Christian armor of the 14th, 15th century. At least this is how the Italians saw it. There are other uh, wall paintings at the Church of St. Demetrius at the back Patricate in Kosovo dating to 1346. Uh, the several figures displayed are actually uh, an early 17th century restoration, but they're considered artistically to be quite similar to the mid 14th century originals, right? Um, there we know some specific figures were altered. One of the latter is Michael Archangel wielding a quite impressive saber that we don't understand whether it was properly like the 1346 original, but uh, there are some mistakes in the design, but it's definitely striking. Um, for the rest, the, there is a straight sword depicted, which is also Western European. 
compatible absolutely with, with the times. There is a crossbow that, if um, properly from the mid 14th century, would be the first, at least among the first, to appear in Balkan art. Uh, and this mm, occurs because of the greater steps influence uh, also the uh, say lesser technological availability um, in a sense um, this crossbow is represented a bit confused in detail so it has importance we can assume but um, at least we can see through it some kind of um, modernization of local warfare happen already by, by the mid 14th century you know that crossbows were just the norm uh, in 12th 13th century western warfare so this this gives you a kind of timeline dimension of you know, what the Balkans were comparatively. Finally for Serbia we see other wall paintings from the Church of the Apostles in the back Patriarchate in Kosovo dating uh, we, we already mentioned them before it's the one of the 1350 57 and um, it's um, however worth noticing uh, uh, among the, the, the series of saints depicted the um, Balkan minor warrior estate uh, typology that would have made up in fact the bulk of Serbian forces before the Ottomans took over the country right so just graphically speaking they, they haven't given an idea of what that uh, rank and file um, maybe not literally but say that a bit like the gentry this kind of more mm, active and unprejudiced um, say middle class of some sort would like to have fortune make fortune in, in the army would have looked like so speaking of other areas of the Balkans, uh, the nomadic blocks that we encountered in other videos, for example, made one last year on exactly the 14th century black infantrymen that you can go check for further details, had much in common arguably with the Albanians in military style. Um, they were similarly uh, ancient people predating in some ways the Slav conquest in spite of all the, the the modifications that they had undergone and so the Slavic also colonization of the of the Balkans at, at large and at least the Slavization of many other uh, local communities. Um, these peoples were more primitive they were tribal rather than feudal in nature and as we've seen already the Bulgarians or the Serbians were the, weren't the top feudal uh, realities of, of medieval Europe, but um, the blacks were s somewhat still organized as semi-nomadic pastoralists. They, uh, I mean, some of them lived in settled village communities, but were more prone to transhumance, and this is allegedly also how mm, an important part o of romance came came to um, to eventually move towards the areas of today's Romania compared to times where probably the area was uh, had lost part of that kind of Roman influence it had from the uh, from from ancient times. Vlachs uh, inhabited, in fact, areas uh, far beyond present-day Romania, including, for example, parts of Greece and Bosnia. Um, and um, some authors go as far as saying that they had preserved, even in their military tradition, some sort of classical uh, Roman-Greek influence. This would be proven by the persistence of certain funeral games, um, traditions of jousting horsemen that would be reminiscent of the Roman Ipica Gymnasia and other kind of... Um, you know, equestrian characteristics of those ancient uh, cultures. Um, in a way, like all peoples, and especially the ones inhabiting this Im importantly step influence areas, would have this type of games. Right? They they were present everywhere um, in, in the in the rest of, of 
of Europe at large, right? You know, jousting was just uh, an evolution, like together with tournament of this kind of games. Even in Anatolia, they had these things, so it's debatable. Also consider, I don't know, uh, the Serbian tradition of eating it, uh, bringing food at the, the graves. Um, this, this is very ancient things that were done since the ancient world that eventually, you know, we, we modernized and secularized and in other countries we don't have them uh, anymore. But they are a broader universal legacy. So aside from the ethnic question of who were the blacks and, and the Romanians and so on, this is not an issue now. But let's say that as far as the, the, the military, uh, kind of military savage and in fact also guerrilla based, raiding based nature of this, in fact, herdsmen, uh, we, we have no doubt. Right, and the blacks in this sense were not that different from other from other people around. Right? Also, the, the Bulgarians had this kind of lifestyle in part. Also, the, the Serbians in part. So, it, it's it's very complex. It depends on the properly on the politics of it all, on the society of it all, in part also the geography of it all, and perhaps we will see it better in another video. However, the blacks, like many of other Balkan people, had long served in Byzantine armies, right, and continued to do so during the 12th, the 14th centuries, and especially the poor populations tended to seek fortune in the service of other peoples, and especially this pastoralist nomad, right. Um, there are similar dynamics even in Western Europe, right, from the, from the uh, the, commu the communities living in, in the valleys that at some point could not sustain the demographic growth, it would send them out just like they, and to s seek for fortune, mostly they became um, mercenaries also because mountaineers are rougher, more primitive, more savage, more brutal, as a matter of fact. Um, they have uh, less to lose. Um, and so this is a pretty uh, constant dynamic as well. By the late 14th century, however, the blacks were fighting also for the Ottoman Turks, which many uh, Balkan people again did as well, especially when they were taken over by, by the Ottomans. The emergence of black principalities um, in what was later to become Romania began in the 13th century, a moment of great uh, growth all over the continent, so that the old black um, tribal structure was essentially giving way to this more hierarchical forms where the local hospodars or magnates were essentially monopolizing in part also the military organization uh, and uh, so like as, as the mob fundamentally and uh, becoming also more militarily uh, qualitative in an elite sense um, uh, from Wallachia we have, for example, from the 13th century, an interesting uh, sword in Buzau that is preserved as at the Slatineano collection of, of Bucharest. Uh, and that is almost surely a German import. You know that there were lots of Saxon uh, colonists in, in uh, Transylvania and um, they exported, of course, weapon reels in the surrounding areas. Um, Buzau is in the Wallachian lowlands and uh, an area dominated by the Eurasian steppes nomads, the Pechenegs, the Kipchaks. So most of the, the blacks would kind of seek refuge in the mountains, carry out guerrilla against the invaders and then hopefully return in the more sedentary uh, areas. Um, and this world um, is likely to have arrived through uh, through Transylvania in in the region, in the area. We have fragments of terracotta decorative plaques from uh, the citadel of Kurtea de Arges from the mid 14th century, now preserved at the National Museum of Bucharest. Um, which shows interesting military styles that uh, you would somewhat expect from, from this area. Consider that uh, the Corte de Argesh was 
uh, at least for nominally under the Hungarian crown. Uh, but there was important Turco-Mongol influence in it as well. The Valachians were Orthodox uh, and their art as a consequence followed mostly the Byzantine canon. So we find for example the uh, here represented on the plaques helmets of somewhat Byzantine form, a horseman carrying a round shield, uh, another one a spear, and more significantly a Turkish style saber with a curved hilt even. And so this tells you of the interesting melange you could fight uh, in, in, Vala in, in Valachia as well. German imports, um, Byzantine forms, Turco-Mongolian influence, etc. It's important to understand that the Carpathians uh, shielded um, significantly uh, Transylvania from the Turkic peoples that inhabited the western steppes, the Pechenegs, the Kipchaks, the Mongols, right? So Valachian in the south of, of the Carpathian was exposed to it as, as it was um, what would have in fact become uh, Moldavia uh, that um, was essentially settled by Orthodox blacks that were escaping actually the mostly the Western uh, Catholic Hungarian feudal pressure and trying to in fact uh, get some new lands east of the Carpathians. Actually the Hungarian kings were were also pushing for this because the blacks in that sense were in theory their their subjects so extending control uh, east of the Carpathians meant a very interesting game that could bring the Hungarians as they did to play in in the Russian Palatinate even even in competition with Poland I made a video about the kingdom of Galicia Volinia that talks about this and also the one about Moldova is, is, is quite um, enlightening in that regard um, so that's how Moldavia would be created actually uh, remaining as you understand importantly decentralized uh, so these were Orthodox blacks again uh, from Transylvania that crossed the Carpathian Mountains in the late 13th century, and uh, without distancing too much from the southern slopes of the mountains, established their own principalities there. Um, and other blacks from from the Balkans joined them, by the way. Um, so this principality remained. Uh, under Hungarian overlordship until the 30s of the 14th century. Um, and naturally we can see an important Hungarian influence as well, and so was that of the Kipchak Turks that had been pushed east in, in the process. Naturally there were lots of them remaining there. Um, and um, this, um, this brought to the consolidation of Wallachia and the creation in Moldavia of Moldavia. Uh, the latter winning de facto independence from Hungary in 1359. Um, and as you understand Moldavia was also under the um, influence of, of the uh, of the Rus uh, and even of, of the Poles that tried at some point to to annexate it first playing uh, say in their favor against Hungary and and vice versa let's say, um, and this resulting halbite only on the long run at the end of the Middle Ages of the, of the loss of Moldovan um, independence, because the Ottomans, by the way, intervened uh, as well. So um, for these two areas, we can observe some evidence too. We have an helmet from Austria, 12th century Moldavian, which is pretty similar to the Central Eastern European tradition. Uh, albeit, some, uh, especially the angled outline, suggests maybe something more Eastern than Western. Then there are some weapons from Bitsa uh, Doamne Piatra Neant, um, dating to 
the 12th, 13th century, um, which include a, a war axe or a work axe, we don't know often, arrow and harrow head scabbard shapes. Um, these uh, weapons are interesting because they look uh, pretty much Western and Central European. So this would, especially in such a relatively early date, suggest that uh, the blacks were um, also part the product of the migration of people from the from 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 the west, right? From from say even from if they had been just Transylvanian blacks and so on, um, crossing the Carpathians and extending this east, so the west in its frontier overflowing at the expense of the nomadic peoples. And this is also fascinating if you think about that because it means that even though they could launch these raids and think about the Mongols and so on, at the end of the day they didn't have a real kind of base from which they could further, uh, you know, absorb the West. It was actually the other way around. Then there is a silver belt uh, mount set from Voynesti. Uh, this is either Moldavian or Hungarian. And probably dated to the 13th century. And what you see is, is, a, is a typically Western European sword belt, for which we think it, it was made in Hungary, that at this point was claiming suzerainty over uh, Moldavia. And we have even older finds from Moldavia, um, dating even as early as the 10th, 11th century for our video. Uh, spearheads or, or arrowheads, um, axes, uh, etc. Uh, as you understand, also for such an early age, you can't really distinguish a, a military weapon from a civilian tool. Um, and they may have been used by the settled Romanian speaking Moldavians as well as by the Turkic nomadic peoples that inhabited the, the area. And surely there, there was some mix of sort. We also have an axe from Kozanesti uh, from the 13th century. We think, given the thickness of the axe, that this was just a, a tool rather than a weapon. But in Byzantine and Russian art we find um, war axes with long spikes at the back, which could definitely belong to this kind of um, almost um, colony frontier, but also maybe even to some Scandinavian influence, or at least the, the, the Varangian one in the mm. specialized function of heavy infantry that uh, those peoples would um, sell to, to Constantinople. Um, we have um, different uh, types of evidence from the, the broader area. Arrowheads of western steppe nomad origin from the 11th, 13th century, excavated in what is today Moldavia, proving what naturally what we already knew, that it was um, settled by nomadic peoples, uh, and independently from the fact that it could even be somewhat nomadized Europeans of some sort, but um, most of them would be Turkic in origin and, and speech. Uh, we have a male shirt from Tarnovo, Bulgarian, uh, between the dating to the t between the 12th and the 14th century. There is a neck opening on the male shirt that makes it similar to the steppe nomads and um, uh, and the, the Middle Eastern peoples, uh, as opposed to the more European types that we documented for, for Bulgaria uh, itself. We have maize heads from uh, the historical museum of Gazanlik in Bulgaria, dating to the 13th to the 14th century, found in the area of Stara uh, Zagorska, and these are mm, definitely Turkic in at least in influence that dominated uh, the area but they they were somehow similar to to, to the Balkan average as well. 
Um, speaking of Bulgaria a little bit, I think we neglected it. Um, there is some mid uh, 14th century evidence as for the other countries that is kind of more eloquent, let's say. For example, um, there's a Psalter today preserved at the Bayerische Staatsbibliothek in Munich. It's the uh, Slavic code number four, uh, dating to the between the, the 50s and the 70s of the 14th century. Um, and we think it is Bulgarian, at least we, uh, it's an hypothesis. Um, and it may have, in fact, been made exactly in the last years of Bulgarian independence. Um, there is definitely a lot of archaic uh, Byzantine art uh, that is, however, mitigated probably by this changing uh, situation. And, um, for example, we see an army wearing lamellar armor of Turco-Mongol form, which would speak also much more directly of the present um, of the time. Um, still, the warriors are armed altogether in late Byzantine or Eastern European um, arms and armor. They have tall triangular shields, um, and this means that the Bulgarians at that point were important under important Turkish influence. And this may have easily come, by the way, not just from, from the Ottomans that were essentially overrunning the southern Balkans, but also from Wallachia, from Ukraine, even from, from Hungary, from, say, the Kumans that had been settled there. Um, we don't know. We see a long box-like quiver of one bow-armed horseman, which is pretty much Eurasian. Uh, step, let's say, traditionally at the time, um, albeit the straight-legged riding position is also not the one of a step archer as well, so it may easily be a blend. There is a button tunic which definitely remembers the Kipchak or Kun Hungarian nomadic one, as well as telling the truth, 15th century Ottoman costumes that were much influenced also by the, the Tartar uh, fashion. There is no uh, warrior wearing the brimmed Chapelle de Fer helmets, uh, but typical late Byzantine manuscripts, illuminations. On the contrary, the soldiers here have a tall conical helmet that is very similar to the one of the Russian art. You can see, however, some very similar ones also in the Hungarian National Chronicle dating more or less to the same period. Um, there are some additional neck guards in these elements which are also interesting. We find interesting wall paintings in Bulgaria too, uh, the, uh, dating to 1350-55 in the Semen Monastery. In them we see helmets of an almost Spangenhelm form, right? Uh, it was definitely very old-fashioned by those times um, uh, and yet we can first of all co count them in the broader Western tradition, which is interesting. Secondly, we have to consider that these paintings were made when the monastery was um, within the Serbian Empire, Stefan Dusan, and we have seen that in Serbian art there are these kind of archaically looking Spangenhelm-like helmets as well. So it's dangerous to draw um, a connection, but it could be um, interesting to anyway. Uh, the shield is closer to Byzantine style, but this reconfirms the broader base background of the, the local art. Finally, we have uh, the famed uh, illuminations, I use them often in the Byzantine history videos, of the Manasseh, uh, Manasseh's Chronicle. Uh, uh, the, this manuscript dates um, specifically to 1341-5, preserved at the Vatican Libraries, the Slavic Code number 2. And there are plenty of images of Bulgarian horsemen 
Also here you find a framed Spangenhelm that is a bit more difficult to identify in the art that is not um, say it's, it's not so well laid out represented because the, the, the pictures are, are small but th this would reconfirm that kind of archaism we were talking about before there are visible pieces of armor such as allen tails and quaffs pointed helmets possible lamellar allen tail or neck guard uh, then there are mm, tall, flat top, kite shaped shields like the ones represented in Byzantine art. Um, albeit, uh, mm, there could be a very early example of a non symmetrical cavalry shield uh, with its top left hand corner swept up to protect the left side of the rider's head, um, which is something that. Uh, eventually we find it was in the asymmetry in in the Balkan area uh, in the late Middle Ages and may have had interesting origins we can't digress on now but um, it may have already been there uh, as uh, if you think that they would become pretty stereotypically Balkan Hungarian and even Ottoman right so those shields with um, again Asymmetrical, even with a with a part that is higher than another. Right in the 15th, in the 17th century, they were all over the place in Central Europe and the Balkans. Thanks to this early origin, it may have been um, an external influence, or but uh, it's more likely that they actually derived from a very uh, an interestingly old, at least, and properly autochthonous. Uh, Central Eastern Balkan tradition and connected with the um, greater flexibility of the local cavalry of some sort. Remember what we were saying before also for the lighter type of horseman that was documented so well by the, that male shirt of uh, from Bulgaria. Well, mm, that may have made a pair with this shield. What is interesting also of this uh, Manassas Chronicle uh, illuminations is that the banners are no longer European in style, but they look much more like the Russian and especially the Turco Mongol uh, steppe people ones. Um, and this, in, in fact, if you look at the, at the illuminations, you can easily see that they are the, the this especially the what are represented to be properly the Bulgarians by the same Bulgarian source to be much more steps like in uh, in outlook and that's kind of in the properly in the Eurasian steps tradition as you can see from the migration era onward so mm, it's a very interesting set of archaisms um, but also of innovation and you can never be sure from just like an illumination or um, a single iconographic source how much of that was present on the battlefield and this is a bit the problem we have with the Balkans that we um, we, we don't s that we don't know s too much right so of course archaeology can discover lots of other interesting things but generally speaking the the, the iconographic sources are also a very precious source and they they would also conceptualize what was seen not necessarily as you understand through the Byzantine canon or the reality but let's say some details at least uh, provide us as we've seen today with some interesting uh, info on how th this, this stuff was actually built in forms of arms and armor and so on and so those are uh, if compared, they can reveal interesting influence. If it were just a matter of art, right, which is at another level compared to arms and armor, but very often it's basically the, the only, th almost the only thing we know about uh, the panoplies of those times. So I think this survey was pretty interesting because you, you have seen to which degree the Balkans naturally are influenced by external forces because simply there is not a major power in them so they're somewhat like a sponge uh, 
they get everything from also from from hell of military cultures and as states in difficulty sometimes in agony they somewhat just adapt to this uh, broader status and they don't seem to pioneer any kind of military technology per se right especially after the collapse of the Byzantine Empire the, uh, also the area is um, is deeply westernized much more than we realize it, it was true also before because that was the broader trend um, and then there are the Ottomans and uh, that bring in this Middle Eastern and even just Near Eastern in part we've seen also just uh, Egyptian but especially Mongol influence Plus, there is always the Seps peoples that are ne live next door, sometimes much closer than the same Westerners, and so they leave an important trace. And naturally, in order to understand better this local warfare, we have to analyze, as we will in our medieval warfare series, the arms and armor, uh, of course, in part, of all these various peoples, especially their army organization, uh, their tactics, and studying some battle, importantly enough. Um, so, mm, for today, however, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.